behalf of the three sponsoring groups, I welcome you to this evening's forum, The Politics of Antisemitism, asking the question, is criticism of Israel anti-Semitic? We hope for a frank, open, and respectful discussion. The three groups who have organized tonight's event do so as self-respecting in their support for Palestinian human rights and in their opposition to anti-Semitism. The Canada-Palestine Support Network, CanPalNet, works to build a cross-country solidarity movement with the Palestinian people to join in this international, international movement just as Canadians organized in South African apartheid. A key goal is to create a cry for the Canadian government to demand the implementation of international law and United Nations resolutions regarding Israel and Palestine. <clears throat> Jews for a Just Peace is an organization of Vancouver Jews whose purpose is to build support in our community for a fair and just solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They are allied with similar Jewish, Palestinian, and other groups, both within and outside Israel and the occupied territories, working in solidarity toward peace. The Trade Union Committee for Justice in the Middle East is an organization of trade unionists who share a deep concern about the situation in the Middle East. TECMI calls for, amongst other things, the pursuit of peace based on equality between Israelis and Palestinians, which respects international law and abides by United Nations resolutions with a goal to achieving a lasting just settlement in the region. They also have a particular focus on workers' rights in the occupied territories. And all three groups have information tables, so please do, when you have a moment, stop by to get more information. And I would now like to take a few moments to introduce our chair for this evening's forum. Dr. Birgit Reim has an undergraduate degree in history, a master's in public health and epidemiology, and a master's and doctorate in psychology. She's a visiting professor and research associate at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Reim's research has been connected to issues of oppression. She is currently researching the effects of discrimination and social inequality on First Nations health, particularly maternal and child health. Dr. Reim was raised by anti-fascists shortly after Hitler's election in 1933. Her grandfather, a member of the Communist Party, was deported. He spent six years in a concentration camp for his active resistance to Nazism. And as an important note to this evening's discussion, her grandfather received compensatory benefits from the German state, while others who suffered similar fates Roma, homosexuals, and prostitutes, for example, did not. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Birgit Ryan. Thanks very much for this warm welcome. And Erika also explained why I'm going to have an accent tonight. And um, dear guests, welcome to the meeting tonight, and thanks very much for showing up um, here. What? You can't hear me? And now? Okay. So, welcome to the meeting tonight, and thanks very much for showing up. And according to our schedule tonight, after my very brief introduction of our speaker, Dr. Finkelstein will speak for about one hour and 15 minutes, and after that, we'll have a short break for announcements, and um, people can just gather their thoughts around before we start the question and answer period. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest. Our speaker today is Dr. Norman Finkelstein. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1953. Dr. Finkelstein received his doctorate from the Department of Politics at Princeton University for a thesis on the theory of Zionism. Currently, he teaches political science at DePaul University in Chicago. To date, Dr. Finkelstein is the author of four books, First Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, published by Verso in 1995, and The Rise and Fall of Palestine, published by the University of Minnesota in 1996. In 1998, together with Ruth Bettina Byrne, who is Chief Historian of the War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity section of the Canadian Department of Justice, he published A Nation on Trial, The Goldhagen Thesis and Historical Truth. And finally, in 2000, he published The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. Furthermore, 
His writings have appeared in prestigious journals such as the London Review, Review of Books, Index on Censorship, and Christian Science Monitor. His work has been translated into 32 um, languages and is discussed around the world. His first book, Dr. Finkelstein, dedicated to his parents, who both survived Nazi concentration camps in Poland, in Auschwitz, and Majdanek. Dr. Finkelstein belongs to the minority of Jewish authors and activists who openly oppose Israeli state policies. He is a constant reminder of the fact that Nazi terror was not restricted to Jews, but that also, also millions of victims that mostly are just mentioned as others, such as Roma people or the handicapped, had the same fate. Also, he does not accept the claim of the uniqueness of the Nazi Holocaust and encourages his readers to consider, for example, the crimes of Americans and Canadians against First Nations and blacks. He has been attacked by Jewish mainstream organizations for his critique of the franchising and capitalizing of the Holocaust. However, among others, the well-respected Jewish historian Raoul Hilberg and Noam Chomsky support his conclusions. I had the chance today to meet Dr. Finkelstein earlier, and I was most impressed by the fact that he remains completely unintimidated by big names on whatever political side they may be, he feels free to criticize them. Checking his homepage, I was shocked, although not surprised, to hear that a German TV station in 2001 removed a documentary film on his work from the program, but after harsh critique from, of influential newspapers, a revised version of the film was broadcasted. The station said the show might trigger unintended effects, indicating it was worried that it might be seen as, as encouraging extreme right views in Germany. The question whether critique towards Israel's current government might have unintended effects as well is what we will discuss today. The title of Dr. Finkelstein's lecture today is Israel and Palestine, Real and Fabricated Disagreements. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Thank you for having me, and I have to report back to Chicago uh, when I return that there is life in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, we thought it was a wilderness here. Uh, actually, I thought it was very near Chicago. I figured I'm in Chicago, which is middle of the United States and towards the north, so I figured it was a half-hour trip, <laughs> and I was kind of shocked. I left work at 5 p.m., for the airport, and I got here Chicago time, 2.30 a.m., which means I could have gotten to Peking, I think, in that time. It was, um, I guess Canada's a big country. I don't know. It's, uh, Americans are not too strong on geography. Uh, or anything else for that matter. <laughs> well, uh, the title of the talk is a slight modification of what I think you intended to hear, but if you bear me out for a short period of time, I'll most certainly get to the subject uh, which seems to have lured you into coming here this evening, namely the topic of anti-Semitism and how does it bear on criticism of Israel. Uh, but before getting there, I want to discuss the topic which I handed to the person who introduced me this evening, namely the subject of real and fabricated disagreements over the Israel-Palestine conflict. And I'm going to begin, if you forgive me, with a kind of personal note, because May 2004 marks a small anniversary for me. Uh, exactly 20 years ago uh, this month, uh, perhaps just a couple of weeks difference, a book came out by an author or alleged author named uh, Joan Peters, and the book was entitled From Time Immemorial. When the book, uh, and I had walked into a bookstore, it was just at that point, at the end of my research phase for my doctoral dissertation, and was going to commence the phase of organizing the material and then writing. Uh, and I walked into a bookstore, and I see this book. It was then Harper and Row books. Now they're Harper Collins. I see this book. It's entitled From Time Immemorial. And the book promises, according to the front cover, uh, 
to revolutionize our understanding of the Israel-Palestine conflict. I then, as most academics do, a topic to which I'll return later, I flipped to the back of the book to see who had written blurbs for the book. And in fact, the blurbs were quite impressive. You had people like Nobel laureates Saul Bellow, Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, historian Barbara Tuckman, another Holocaust historian named Lucy DeWidowicz, uh, a quite impressive roster of endorsements for the book, all promising in one form or another that it's going to revolutionize our understanding of the Middle East. Well, uh, that, of course, filled me with a little bit of trepidation because I thought I had a fairly st a good handle on the topic, and I was preparing to write my dissertation, and, of course, I was fearful that everything that I that I thought I knew would now prove to be wrong. And uh, the Peters thesis was really quite audacious. Her basic thesis was that contrary to all conventional opinion, Palestine had been empty on the eve of the Zionist colonization. The settlers came to Palestine, made the desert bloom, and then all the Arabs from neighboring countries surreptitiously they sneaked into Palestine and they pretended to be indigenous to the area. Uh, that in fact, all of these Palestinian refugees were really simply immigrants from neighboring countries who wanted to exploit the opportunities created by the Zionist settlers and that this whole notion of uh, uh, Palestinian people was not just metaphorically, but it was literally a fraud. Uh, I noticed the person in the front seat here laughed when she uh, heard that. And had it been another time in another place, I would have laughed as well. But this was a different point in my life. It was 1984. And when I was a young person, I had very strong political beliefs. And I also, those beliefs, I thought, were solidly grounded in scholarship, solidly grounded in facts and history. Uh, I read a lot, uh, in, uh, read, read a lot of literature conforming to my political beliefs, and even read literature which opposed my political beliefs. Uh, nonetheless, I was quite confident that what I believed was right. Uh, by the late 1970s, events unfolded in parts of the world which uh, proved to be a, a really crushing, uh, a crushing awakening for me. Uh, many things which I was absolutely certain were true proved not to be true. And scholars who I had a very high regard for and who had excellent academic credentials uh, from the, the best universities and the best formal training and scholarship, they turned out to be wrong. Uh, as I said, it was a totally crushing experience for me. Uh, my world literally caved in, and there were uh, quite a number of weeks where I just... I, I, my recollection is, and it's kind of uh, vague now, but I just was in bed totally um, devastated. Uh, I was lucky it came at a relatively young age. Other people had those political awakenings at a later age uh, and were never able to bounce back. I was able to bounce back, but I learned a very good lesson then. And the lesson is that uh, you better listen to all sides and you better be very careful about what you say and what you think. And don't dismiss anything as being absurd or ridiculous. Uh, be patient. Go through the evidence. Uh, so when the Joan Peters book came out, even though on the face of it, the thesis seemed absolutely absurd, how could four and a half million people now uh, have fabricated their genealogies that just seemed on the face of it uh, absurd? On the other hand, Unlike other people, I was simply not willing to dismiss it out of hand because it didn't conform to my beliefs. Based on past experience, my beliefs could be wrong. And so I took the book, and uh, I have to admit with a certain amount of defensiveness, but I picked up that book and I started to go through it footnote by footnote. Uh, Peters used to boast that the book had 1,853 footnotes, uh, and it was a very formidable scholarly apparatus. That's the fancy word for all the footnotes at the end. And I sat down, and I went at that book methodically. And the book was very densely written. The prose was almost impenetrable, purposely, purposely I think. Uh, 
uh, but I wouldn't give up. Uh, if I was wrong, I wanted to know I was wrong, and I wanted to know it then and not later, because I had been, as I said, seduced by causes which proved to be, for me at least, an, a, a moral and an intellectual embarrassment. Uh, and there was a core of the book which was a demographic study of population movements in Palestine. Uh, the book had a, a large number of chapters devoted to this study, and it also had a large number of charts at the back. The demographic study was endorsed by one of the leading population experts in the United States, a fellow named Philip Hauser, who was the chair of the Department of, um, uh, of Demography, it wasn't called demography, population studies at the University of Chicago. It was a very prestigious position. And he even had a, a letter appended at the end of the book affirming Peters' findings. And that was very intimidating to me. I obviously didn't then and don't know now anything about demography. And here was a leading authority in the topic. Well, notwithstanding that intimidating authority figure hanging before me, I sat down and I started to go through those charts with a vengeance. I don't believe in computers. Well, I do believe in computers. I still don't use calculators. I had a piece of paper. I had my um, uh, pencil. And I'm sitting and lying down that bed. I'm going to figure this out if it kills me. Because if it's right, I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I want to know it now. So I go through these charts. I go through these charts, checking the numbers, flipping the book back and forth, back and forth. Finally, around 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m., one evening, late in the early one morning, uh, I discover that the key number in the charts is a fraud. The key number is a fake, and there was no question whatsoever that that number was not accidentally faked. The way the material was arranged, it was clearly premeditated. Well, I was, you know, I was a young, relatively young man then. I was just gripped with, you know, feeling, you know, the chills going down your spine. I can't believe it. And I was, had a small studio apartment, and I was pacing back and forth. I did it. I did it. I can't believe it. I did it. I was almost breathless, uh, and I did what any good Jewish boy does at that moment. It was 1.30 a.m., but I called my mother. <laughs> and um, um, my mother got on the phone, and I said, Mom, I did it. I did it. I did it. And my mother said, you know, Norman, I'm very happy for you, like a good Jewish mother. And then she paused and she said, well, what did you do? And, uh, it was impossible at 1.30 in the morning to explain this demographic chart. I said, I, um, you know, I discovered a fraud, a hoax, no question about it. I, wasn't, I had very little doubt. I can't say no question about it. Uh, the omnibus dubitandum, that's, you know, uh, Marx, always doubt. Uh, but I was pretty confident. I remember later, I have a very good friend who recently passed away, the Marxist economist, some of you may know, Paul Sweezy, and he once commented to me afterwards, he said that uh, discovering a fraud is every scholar's eureka, and <laughs> it was my eureka, you know, uh, and uh, then it proved that my findings were right, and uh, that was one stage, and then the next stage was I sent out a copy of my findings to everybody who I thought, not everybody, but let's say 20, it was about 25 people who I thought would be interested in the topic or in, interested in my discovery, as it were. Uh, 24 of the 25 didn't respond at all. The 25th did respond. Uh, one Saturday morning, I remember quite vividly, I got a phone call, and the person on the other side identified himself as, this is uh, Professor Chomsky calling. Uh, not every day Professor Chomsky calls a uh, young man living in Washington Heights on a uh, barely surviving uh, salary. And uh, he said that he read my findings. He found them uh, convincing. And that was probably just the tip of the iceberg. That If I go through the book more carefully, you'll probably discover that the whole thing is a fraud. Uh, well, you know, I'm a person of the left, and when you get a call from Professor Chomsky, uh, <laughs> his wish is your command. So I, uh, for the next several months, devoted myself to going through the whole scholarly apparatus, checking everything against the original sources, and it turned out that what he said was uh, correct. The whole book was a fraud from start to finish. Uh, all the documents were mangled, falsified. It was uh, uh, quite a spectacular hoax. Um, 
And that's when I sort of uh, became uh, involved in a large way in the Israel-Palestine conflict. I first became involved politically during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in June 1982. And it was at that point I decided to write my doctoral dissertation on Zionism. Uh, by 1984, uh, you know, you could say, as it were, I gave over my life to the movement. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And now when you look back, it's an anniversary of sorts. And anniversaries are always moments for reflection. And, uh, you know, I had to, in the past few months, reflect not only on the passage of time, painful as that is, uh, but uh, also on what was accomplished and what did I learn over these past 20 years. And the main thing I learned, it's a kind of underwhelming self-revelation, uh, the main um, underwhelming epiphany. The main thing I learned is that, in fact, the Israel-Palestine conflict is really not complicated at all. It doesn't raise any terrifically complicated moral questions. There are some to which I'll return. And on the historical questions, it doesn't raise anything really significantly uh, difficult to apprehend. Uh, it's not a complicated conflict, in my view. Uh, and in fact, at least at two levels, there's practically no controversy that remains at all. I don't say at all, but practically no controversy that remains. On the historical record, namely the record of what happened over the past hundred years, uh, there's relatively little controversy now. There was a period when there was a lot of controversy. There are enough people in the audience who are roughly of my generation uh, to recall that even as late as the 1970s, 19, early 1980s, there was a kind of dominant, I hate academic terms, so I should be shot if I use any of them, but I'll use one, and I'll, I'll limit myself to that. There was a kind of dominant narrative of what happened in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it was more or less the official Israeli view. For any of you of the older generation who read Leon Uris's Exodus, you can call it pretty much the Exodus version of history. Uh, and that was the dominant one. Uh, and then alongside the dominant one, there was on the margins or on the fringes, there were some dissenting voices claiming that the interpretation that we were familiar with, the one we had read and heard over and over again, that that interpretation was, in fundamental ways, untrue. So you take the case uh, of the Palestinian refugees, the dominant interpretation, the one which everybody heard and, or had known by memory, I'm sure, by the, up until the mid-1980s, was that the Arab armies invade Palestine in 1948. There were these Arab radio broadcasts telling the Palestinians to flee. The Palestinians... Uh, followed the orders from the radio, left, and uh, it was supposed to be the Arab armies were going to sweep the Jews into the sea and then the Palestinians would return, but that's not what happened, and so the Palestinians got what they deserved. Well, already in the early 1960s, there were two scholars, one named Erskine Childers, an Irishman, and a Palestinian named Vali Khalidi, and uh, they went back and they checked this original interpretation because as it happened, or I should say, <clears throat> this official interpretation, because as it happened, that area in 1948 was very heavily monitored by intelligence organizations, and they all kept tapes of the radio broadcasts. So Mr. Childers and Mr. Khalidi, they go and they check the various tapes of the radio broadcasts, go through all of them. They find no evidence of Arab radio broadcasts. It didn't happen. They published their findings in a British periodical called The Spectator, but it had relatively little impact. The dominant narrative uh, remained, though people knew on the fringes there were some dissenting voices. Well, things have dramatically changed now. Uh, the, the history now, uh, as it happens, what was called the dissenting voices and the uh, 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 marginal voices the marginal and dissenting voices have now pretty much moved center stage, and what was the official interpretation or the mainstream interpretation has now been pretty much demolished. On the question of the Palestinian refugees, you can say, for example, there are differences of opinion about uh, exactly the extent to which 1948 was an ethnic cleansing. People like Benny Morris, who's the main Israeli historian, 
1948, we'll say it was, <coughs> excuse me, we'll say it was a partial ethnic ex uh, cleansing. Other Israelis and non-Israelis, uh, people like Baruch Kimmerling or others, they'll say it was an ethnic cleansing from beginning to end. But they'll all agree it was some form of ethnic cleansing. That much there's a consensus on. Even conservative Israeli historians like the biographer of uh, Ben-Gurion, Shabtai Tevet, uh, Tevet will tell you it was an ethnic cleansing uh, beginning with the Arab invasion. Well, that's already half of the Palestinians than he concedes were expelled uh, uh, in 1948. So you have, on the historical side, I gave you one illustration with the refugee question, but on the historical side, you have basically a consensus about what happened over the last hundred years. I won't say there's a consensus on all minor points, but there's certainly a consensus on major points. There are some areas of disagreement, not in my opinion profound, except for a couple of places. But you can say that on the historical side, on the question of facts, strictly on the question of facts, what happened, there's very little controversy any longer among historians. Uh, about the historical record. That's uh, not a subject of great disputation. If, we, if there's not much disputation in the historical record, when we come to the human rights side of the question, that is to say, what's happening now in the occupied territories, in fact, there's no dispute at all, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, there are multiple human rights organizations uh, working in the occupied territories in Israel. There are the main, the main ones, uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which have a global mandate and also amid a global mandate, they discuss, the, they uh, monitor the Israel-Palestine conflict. So you have the large organizations. Then you have the main Israeli human rights organization, Beth Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, uh, very reputable and very exacting. And then you have all these other human rights organizations there. You have Physicians for Human Rights, Israel, Public Committee Against Torture, Israel, all of these local organizations which are working on more narrow issues on the human rights questions in the occupied territories. Now there, even though the organizations have their own research staffs and their own uh, individual field staffs, and even though they're all uh, very independent-minded, uh, if you read their reports, there's agreement not only on the major, uh, the substan substantive issues, but there's agreement on the details. I had uh, the good or bad fortune uh, over the past several months of going through all the human rights reports from, say, the last three, last five years, uh, <clears throat> four or five years. And it's a lot. It's about 3,000 pages or more. It's a huge amount of uh, material devoted to the human rights situation in the occupied territories. Well, you couldn't find any disagreement on anything, on the major points, the minor points, the trivial points. They all agreed on everything. There's a, you can say here you can use the word consensus without qualification. It's not a broad consensus. It's not as people incorrectly use the word general consensus. There's a consensus, no disagreement whatsoever on what happened. You take the case, for example, of Janine, the siege of Janine, which the culmination of uh, Operation Defensive Shield in April 2002, you opened up the Human Rights Watch report. It says that Israel committed humanitarian crimes and crimes against humanity. You open up the Amnesty International report, they say the same thing. You open up the Beth Selim report, they say the same thing. No controversy, no disagreement whatsoever. And that brings me to sort of the uh, topic of my uh, uh, talk this evening. Namely, if what I say is true, if what I say is true, there's a broad consensus on the historical question, and there is a consensus without qualification on the human rights question, then what accounts for all of the controversy surrounding the Israel-Palestine conflict? What accounts for this kind of violent disputation, disagreement over the conflict? And what I want to suggest this evening is that there are basically two kinds of disagreement on the Israel-Palestine conflict. There is what I would call real, authentic disagreements, which people can 
uh, which we, uh, those involved in politics have to contend with uh, because they're real and they're not, uh, and uh, they're re they confront real life issues. And then there are the fabricated, contrived, fraudulent forms of disagreement. Excuse me. Let me begin with the real disagreements, the ones about which we have to confront the reality of. Uh, and uh, let's take as a, an example the one I gave a few moments ago, namely the refugee question. Now, you can agree the fact, you can agree with the factual record that the Palestinians suffered an ethnic cleansing in 1948. That's a historical question. It's a factual question. But then there is a moral question. And the moral answer does not follow from the factual one. That is, you can say, yes, it was an ethnic cleansing. But you can also say, I think that's a good thing. That not all ethnic cleansings are bad. Some ethnic cleansings are bad. Some ethnic cleansings are good. That's a moral judgment. So the main Israeli historian on the Palestinian refugees, Benny Morris, he says, yes, it was a partial ethnic cleansing, but personally, I think that was a good thing. He says that um, the ethnic cleansing of North America was a good thing because it helped create a vibrant democracy in America. So it was a good thing. And he says that the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians was also a good thing. In fact, he says, uh, I think Ben-Gurion's big mistake in 1948 is that he didn't expel all the Palestinians. He should have expelled them from the area that became Israel. He should have expelled them from the West Bank, and he should have expelled them from the Gaza. He should have cleared out all the Palestinians, and then we wouldn't have these problems today. Well, that's a moral judgment. He doesn't dispute the facts, though lately his, his ravings have now started to teeter into the, the netherworld. Uh, but um, he doesn't uh, dispute the facts. Uh, he just has, uh, renders a different moral judgment on those facts. Or you can take the case of the uh, distinguished professor of ethics at Harvard Law School, uh, Alan Dershowitz. And if you open up his book, Chutzpah, he says that, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, he says, ethnic cleansings are, quote, a fifth-rate moral issue, and no different. He says, and they're analogous, I'm now quoting him, they're now, uh, their ethnic cleansings are analogous to massive urban renewal. You know, no, no problem there. So, you know, when the uh, Spanish expelled the Jews in 1492, it wasn't ethnic cleansing. It was just massive urban renewal. Okay, those are moral judgments. Uh, they happen to be Nazi moral judgments, but they're, no, they're moral judgments. And people are allowed to have different moral uh, opinions. Leaving aside, you know, the, their world and, then, and, to, and returning to the moral universe of normal human beings, uh, even in uh, the moral universe of nor normal human beings, there's still room for disagreement because you can agree on the factual question, namely it was an ethnic cleansing. You can agree on the moral question, that is, uh, the ethnic cleansing was a, a colossal crime inflicted in the Palestinian people. You can also agree on the legal question, namely those who have suffered ethnic cleansing have the right to return to their homes. That's agreement on the historical question, agreement on the moral qu question, and agreement on the legal question. And there, there's a pretty solid broad consensus of agreement, as I say, when we leave aside the Nazi moral universe and enter the universe of normal human beings. Uh, if you look at Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch, they all issued statements, very firm statements, surprisingly to me, incidentally, but it tells you how, uh, how independent and serious these human rights organizations have become. Uh, they all issued very strong statements saying the Palestinian right of return cannot be uh, abrogated. They have that right. It's under international law. You can't change it. Uh, so you can agree on the uh, factual, the moral, the legal question, but you can have very substantial disagreement on the political question. Namely, you can say, yes, 
It was an ethnic cleansing. Yes, it was morally wrong. Yes, they have the legal right to return. But politically, it's infeasible. It's unrealizable. And uh, that right is going to have, the Palestinians are going to have to forfeit that right. Even though they have the right, it's not realizable. Uh, that's a political judgment. Uh, I don't like to speak for him. He can speak for himself quite eloquently, and then some. But uh, that's Professor Chomsky's view, uh, that the right of return is unrealizable, it's infeasible. And his point of view is to insist on this right. That's the most immoral of things, because you're creating illusions for the Palestinians, uh, for example, uh, in the uh, refugee camps in Lebanon. Uh, you're creating illusions for them and not allowing them to move on in their lives. And that's immoral because it's never going to happen, that, uh, the implementation of the right of return. I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm simply saying that people can have, you know, agreement on major areas, factual, legal, moral, and still there can be room for real disagreement on political questions. And I don't think it's wise, uh, or do I think it's accurate, to write off those people who disagree with you politically on those questions as the enemy. Those are political judgments. And we have to remember that politics at the end of the day is a lot of it is about judgment. Good judgment, bad judgment, wrong judgment, and right judgment. And people are entitled to uh, their judgments without being written off uh, as the enemy on these questions. Uh, that to me is, uh, you know, Example, an example of what we can call legitimate disagreement on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I have to emphasize, however, just so there's no uh, misconstruing my remarks, that at the end of the day, there really isn't that much disagreement among people, uh, real disagreement among people about how to resolve the conflict. There are areas of disagreement, and that right of return is one of those areas of disagreement. But the broad framework for resolving a conflict is not really the subject of any controversy at all. So, for example, on the question of the two-state settlement, if you look at the votes in the General Assembly, I'll just give you know, the consensus for a two-state settlement has now been with us for about 30 years. Since the mid-1970s, there's been a broad consensus in the international community to resolve the conflict through a two-state uh, settlement of it. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, you go to 1989, the UN General Assembly, it votes on a two-state settlement, and the vote is 151 to 3. The three dissenting countries opposing the two-state settlement are the United States, Israel, and the island state of Dominica. That's it. Uh, there were 154 member states of the United Nations, uh, 151 for the two-state settlement, three against the United States, Israel, and Dominica. Now, between 1989 and today, the world has really profoundly changed. Uh, again, another one of those words I don't like, but I'll use it now because it actually works. Uh, geopolitically, the world has profoundly changed. Uh, geo geographically, some of you will be surprised to learn, as I was surprised to learn, that... Uh, in 1989, there were 154 member states of the United Nations. Uh, now there are 191 in 15, in 15 years, uh, about, you know, well, you can do the math yourself, uh, but there are somewhere in the order of 40 new countries uh, in the United Nations. That's a dramatic change, and that dramatic change is a part and parcel of the political change that occurred in the last 15 years, namely an entire social system uh, the Soviet system disappeared. Uh, so we had profound political changes, profound geographical changes. What's quite striking is, notwithstanding these profound changes, geopolitical changes, the consensus on resolving the conflict has rem remained remarkably stable. So if you look at the votes in the General Assembly for the years 2002, 2003, uh, 2001, 2002, and 2003, no, I just, well, I just read one vote last week, it was, so it's 2004 as well. If you look at the votes in the two-state settlement, it's always 160, 150 on the one side, the world, and then on the other side, it's always the United States, Israel, and you can check for yourselves, because I think it is posted on the uh, web, 
the dissenting countries is usually six. The United States is, not usually, I, uh, let me amend that, always. The United States, Israel, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Palu, and Tuvalu. That's it. For those of you who are embarrassed uh, to admit you've never heard of Nauru, Palu, and Tuvalu, either ashamed of your ignorance or your lack of political correctness, uh, I'll admit as well, I had never heard of Nauru, Tuvalu, and, and uh, Palu. I, Palu, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, I, subsequently, I subsequently learned that Nauru is a, it's a square block somewhere in the South Sea Islands. Its main export is uh, bird droppings, guano, I think is the politically correct term. Uh, Tuvalu is a neighbor of Nauru. Tuvalu is suffering a major problem now. It's disappearing uh, due to global warming. The tide is rising and Tuvalu is disappearing. Um, there's an interesting story there because uh, Tuvalu is disappearing because of global warming and we all know the, pro the reason we have global warming is because the United States refuses to sign the Kyoto Protocol. So because uh, the United States refuses to sign the Kyoto Protocol, we have global warming. And because of global warming, the tide is rising. And because the tide is rising, Tuvalu is disappearing. And if Tuvalu disappears, Israel will lose one of its main allies in the world. <laughs> so. It's only a matter of time before Israel accuses the United States of anti-Semitism. <laughs> uh, and as I said recently, in the last year, Palo, P-A-L-A-U, Naruz, N-A-U-R-U, and Tuvalu, T-U-V-A-L-U, they joined the other side. But apart from the United States, Israel, uh, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Tuvalu, and Palu. That's it. That's it. Uh, there's a quite a, um, uh, there's a compelling, we'll call a new expression, it's against broad. There's a compelling consensus supporting the two-state settlement, uh, adamantly opposed by uh, Israel, the United States, and its, uh, and whatever those, the, the country, other countries. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the... Uh, you know, the, as I said, there are areas of legitimate disagreement uh, within the framework, which we shouldn't forget that there's a broad consensus for resolving the conflict, which the United States and Israel have uh, steadfastly um, uh, prevented from realizing its objective, namely to resolve the conflict peacefully and with justice to all sides. Uh, now, there's a large, um, uh, large body of disagreement and controversy about the Israel-Palestine conflict, which to my thinking is completely uh, uh, contrived. It's fabricated. It's, uh, uh, its purpose is to divert and to confuse people about what the real issues are in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it's those fabricated sources of disagreement which I think account for most of the controversy and the disagreement surrounding the Israel-Palestine conflict. And I want to discuss three of those, to my thinking, the three major areas of contrived or fabricated uh, disagreement about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Those kinds of disagreement, the aim and purpose of which is simply to divert attention from the real issues or to simply sow confusion about what are the real issues. One form of this fabricated disagreement is the effort to mystify the conflict to envelop it in this ideological cloud and to pretend that it simply can't be understood unless you have some grasp or the equivalent grasp of rocket, you know, a rocket science or particle physics, that this is a very uh, difficult con conflict to understand. Uh, it goes back, you usually hear things like it goes back to biblical enmities, ancient hatreds, or more recently, clashes of religion, clashes of civilization that it can't be compared to any other conflict. The fancy word is the conflict, they use the Latin expression, it's sui generis, it has, it can't be compared, or in a language we're more accustomed to, it's unique. Like the Nazi Holocaust is unique, and the Jewish people are unique, and the Jewish nation is unique. Anything involving the Jews is always unique. You can't compare. And so, so the Israel-Palestine conflict involves Jews, so you can't compare. It's unique. Well, the fact of the matter is, I don't think it's particularly complicated at all. Uh, 
and if people make the most ordinary sorts of analogies with reasonably comparable situations, it's perfectly clear what happened and what's happening now. Not difficult at all. Let's take the question of resistance. What accounts for the resistance of the Palestinians to, or, or resistance over the last hundred years to the Zionist and later the Israeli enterprise? Well, I was kind of surprised when I uh, opened Benny Morris's book, his bigger volume called Righteous Victims. I'm reading the book, and at some point he writes, early on in the book, he writes as follows. The fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. The fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. Now, some of you are wondering, well, what's, so big, what's such a big deal about that sentence? I could have written it. Yeah, it, you know, it doesn't look particularly brilliant, profound. Uh, and yet, when I read it, the words kind of leapt off the page for me. Why they leap off the page? Well, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say it was anti-Semitism that was the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. He doesn't say it's hatred of Jews or hatred of European civilization or all of those other commonplaces we hear nowadays. His explanation is perfectly straightforward and perfectly uncomplicated, simple. They resisted Zionism because they feared, as it turned out, rightfully so, that if the Zionist movement succeeded in reaching and achieving its objectives, it would be at the expense of the indigenous population, that the indigenous population would be dispossessed and displaced. Not very complicated, perfectly analogous to, well, analogous to what happened in North America. Let's take an obvious example. Let's say you were to, somebody's writing a history book on Native American resistance to Euro-American encroachment. And the resistance was very bloody. You shouldn't kid ourselves about that. The Native Americans, they killed men, women, children, infants. It was brutal. No question about that. We don't want to be politically correct. It was very brutal. It was brutal on the Euro-American side also, but we shouldn't be blinded to the fact that it was also very brutal on the, what you call first, uh, what's the expression you use, first peoples. Uh, it was very brutal on the Native American side. You know, someone like uh, the, uh, the former uh, the president and also historian Theodore Roosevelt, he writes in his book, the, uh, it was multi-volume history, The Winning of the West, he said sometimes, you know, the frontiersmen, they, dissembled, they descended to the levels of savagery of the Native Americans. Yeah, well, it was more than sometimes. It was most of the time. But it was savage in all sides, and we shouldn't kid ourselves about that. Okay, it was brutal. But how would we react if we opened up a history book and a historian tried to explain the Native American resistance, often brutal by saying that they were motivated by anti-Europeanism <laughs> or anti-whiteism or anti-Christianism. Well, you would laugh. You don't need to conjure up profound cosmic explanations about why the Native Americans resisted. The answer is right there. It's staring you in the face. They resisted because they understood that they would, if the Euro-American enterprise succeeded, it, it would result in their, to now use uh, Benny Morris's terms, their territorial displacement and dispossession. Not very complicated, I don't think. The second source or fabricated source of the... Uh, conflict over the Israel-Palestine conflict, the fabricated disagreement, is playing the Nazi, the Holocaust card, the dragging in of the Nazi Holocaust to somehow give, just provide justification or a rationale for what Israel is doing. That card only first began to be played, I should say, in the, in the Western world, 
It only first began to be played after the June 1967 war. Israel from early on tried to play that card, but Israel was just a backwater before 1967, and nobody paid you know, much attention to its efforts to kind of demonize uh, the Palestinians and demonize all criticism of Israel as emanating from anti-Semitism and being equivalent to supporting the Holocaust. Uh, the anti, the uh, Holocaust card, as I said, only first began to be played after the June 1967 war, and the main thrust of that effort was to insist on the uniqueness of the Nazi Holocaust, the uniqueness of the suffering that Jews endured during World War II, and the argument, the unstated but clear, plainly uh, um, intended argument was that because Jews suffered uniquely during World War II, that they were entitled to unique moral dispensations uh, now, that you can not hold Israel and Jews to the same moral standards as other people, because they suffered uniquely uh, during the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, there's a lot to be said on that topic. I'm not sure if now is the time to go into it, but it's uh, important to keep in mind that it was sheer political manipulation of the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, there were Nazi Holocaust figured barely at all in American Jewish life before 1967, and it figured not at all in American life generally after 1967, uh, before 67, for you no know, straightforward political reasons. After World War II, the United States enters into a major political alliance with West Germany, our, the pillar of American power in Europe, and West Germany was staffed, apart from some window dressing, people like Konrad Adenauer, who was an anti fascist, apart from people like Adenauer, the whole German government was staffed with ex Nazis, you know, for obvious reasons. Germany was divided into two. If you were on the left, you went to East Germany. If you were on the right, you stayed in West Germany. And so the whole uh, West German bureaucracy uh, and the legal profession, and medical profession, was all ex-Nazis. And you couldn't talk about the Nazi Holocaust because then you were accused of undermining the U.S.-West German alliance and playing into the hands of the, uh, playing into the, hands of the communists. Because it did happen that, you know, communists didn't like Nazis for good reasons. You know, Hitler killed 30 million uh, about 20 to 30 million Russians. Uh, the war was very brutal on the Eastern Front, very different than what it was on the Western Front. And, uh, you know, Nazis didn't like, uh, you know, the, the communists didn't like Nazis, and they didn't like the West German government because it was staffed with lots of ex-Nazis, mostly ex-Nazis. And uh, also, and there's no question they played that card, the communists, uh, the Soviet government and the communists, that the United States has entered into alliance with Nazis. And so when they played that card, they talked about the Nazi Holocaust, uh, the extermination of the Jews. And because the communists talked about it, uh, those who wanted to distance themselves from the communists and show their loyal Americans, they didn't talk about it. And there was no discussion at all of the Nazi Holocaust in American life. There are many examples I can give uh, later if people want me to give. I can you know, provide lots of documentary evidence uh, on that score. Uh, just as a matter of record, and it's an interesting point, before June 1967, in the whole English language, there were only two scholarly studies in the Nazi Holocaust, just two. There was a, a fellow, Gerald Reitlinger, wrote a book on the Nazi SS, and there was Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of the European Jews. That was the beginning, and that was the end. Uh, when you look at Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem and you look in her bibliography at the end, she writes Eichmann in Jerusalem around 1963, um, she can only find two works in the English language. The conservative estimate now is that there are 10,000 studies in the Nazi Holocaust. Things that have changed rather dramatically for political reasons, I think, more than any other. Uh, uh, it didn't figure at all in American life. Uh, the, the Nazi Holocaust, as I said, I can give lots of illustrations, but I won't belabor that point right now. Uh, and it's also interesting to point out that Israel didn't figure at all, I won't say at all in American Jewish life, but it certainly was at the very bottom of the priorities. If you open up mainstream Jewish magazines from back then, uh, representing mainstream establishment opinion, like the Commentary magazine, uh, commentary sort of like the right end of the political spectrum, 
and Descent magazine is on the left end of the mainstream spectrum. Woody Allen had that joke, which some of you may know, that if commentary, if Descent magazine, which is in the left end, ever merged with Commentary magazine, which is the right end, you'd get dysentery. Uh, <laughs> which was clever. I, you know. um, if you look in Commentary magazine, they used to have in their front cover around the list of all the articles in the magazine, a kind of index and a uh, table of content in the front cover. And usually it was like article number 11 or 12, all the way, all the way at the bottom, there'd be something like Israeli kibbutz. You know, and that was it. You know, it was, uh, they kept themselves, uh, they kept the distance from Israel, American Jews, again for political reasons. There was always the fear of the dual loyalty charge. Uh, that who are you, you know, who is your first loyalty to Israel, the United States? This is before Israel was the main ally of the U.S. So there was a fear of the dual loyalty charge. And there was also a fear of being associated with Israel, which at that time had a profile as a leftist country. Uh, you know, the, these are mostly people like Ben-Gurion are mostly, uh, uh, they're immigrants from Eastern Europe, have a deep affinity with the uh, leftist, uh, even communist movements, of the time. They wanted to be part of the, the third international. They were rejected. That's the Leninist International. They joined the, the Socialist International. They wanted to, be, they saw themselves, you know, Le, Ben Gurion admired uh, Lenin. Uh, uh, and in general, they were people of the left. Uh, and so, uh, and then they had the kibbutzim and they had this austere lifestyle and so on and so forth, which was not only alien to American Jewry, but also a source of fear. And so they kept Israel at arm's length as well. Uh, it's one of the paradoxes, which always, at least it strikes me as a paradox, that um, not only, as I said, was uh, the Nazi Holocaust not a part of American Jewish life, but neither was uh, Israel. Uh, the only two people I could find, I went through the record fairly carefully, the only two people I could find who had any public identification with Israel uh, in the early 1950s the only two I can find were Noam Chomsky uh, and Hannah Arendt. And Noam Chomsky and Hannah Arendt became the main enemies of the Jewish establishment after 1967. Uh, but they were the only ones who had a public identification with Israel. Uh, you go back, I read all the memoirs of what were called the New York intellectuals, mostly Jewish intellectuals who were very uh, uh, articulate and involved in political life. Uh, editor of Commentary Magazine, this fellow named Norman Todd Horitz, uh, editor of Descent Magazine, Irving Howe, uh, even take the person I'm currently writing on, uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz. If you look at his memoir, he says, uh, I never talked, to, we, my, he grew up in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, a Borough Park in Brooklyn, actually eight blocks away from where I lived. He was on 48th Street and 16th Avenue. I was on 40th Street and 16th Avenue. It's an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. He said, growing up, we never talked about the Holocaust. Never. It was just never a subject. And he talks about his first involvement with Israel comes in 1967. Uh, he's pretty straightforward about that. And that's a, a typical profile. Uh, that's why I think it's a mistake. Uh, I'll make the political point now. I think it's a mistake for people to think that American Jewish loyalties of the Jewish establishment uh, with Israel has much to do with ethnic loyalties. And I think that's true at all. There's no evidence whatsoever that these people feel any kind of particular ethnic loyalty or commitment. Because were that the case, then you should have seen that come out in the 1960s, or any kind of real anguish or despair about the Nazi Holocaust. If that were true, you should have seen that in evidence before, and I want to emphasize, before, it became politically convenient to remember the Nazi Holocaust and be pro-Israel. When it was inconvenient to remember it, uh, these people were nowhere to be found, neither at commemorations for the Nazi Holocaust, of which there were a few by leftists, uh, or uh, in support of the state of Israel. And that's why I also think it's completely wrong-headed to describe these people, as is often the case in a kind of hackneyed fashion, to describe these American Jewish elites as being Zionists or to discuss the Zionist lobby. They are not Zionists. And to call them that is totally to, I think, 
mislabel the nature of the beast, as it were, because they have no ideological commitments at all, apart from the commitments to themselves. They're interested in power, and they're interested in privilege. It happens to serve that personal agenda now to be pro-Israel and to remember the Nazi Holocaust. In the 1950s, when it didn't serve the agenda of personal aggrandizement to be pro-Israel or remember the Holocaust, they didn't remember it at all. And they didn't care about Israel. It's a, I think a, if you want to talk about Zionists, you know, Ben Gurion, yes, he was a Zionist. He was ideologically committed to the idea that a Jewish state was the best thing for the Jewish people and that it would solve their problems. He was ruthless, no question. He was uh, fanatical, no question. But he was an ideologically committed Zionist, and which meant, incidentally, he was ruthless, he was fanatical. He was also, by most conventional standards, you'd have to say he was honest. He didn't do it for the privilege, and he liked power, but I don't think it was for him fundamentally about power, and it certainly wasn't about privilege, you know, living well. Uh, these were committed, ideologically committed people. You know, say what you want about Ben, uh, ben uh, Begin, and I haven't have any good things to say about him, uh, though he did have, you know, to his credit, even though all the labor governments uh, practiced torture beginning from the early 1970s, as Amnesty International points out, Israel was routinely uh, torturing Palestinians. It is true to say that Begin was at least committed enough to the rule of law that when he came to power in 77, uh, he abolished torture of Palestinians, and that, in, that endured until 1981. Uh, so he has something to his credit. But the point I was going to make about ben, uh, Begin was when he left office, he went back to his little apartment in Tel Aviv, and he lived very modestly, you know, till his death. It wasn't about power and privilege for them. These were committed ideological people. Uh, the folks we're talking about now, the Canadian Jewish Congress hoodlums, the ADL hoodlums, the B'nai B'rith hoodlums, the World Jewish Congress hoodlums like uh, uh, Israel Singer, uh, and that crowd, uh, they're not interested in ideology. And it has nothing at all to do with concern about the Jewish people. This is pure power and privilege. It's not ideology, and I think it's completely mistaken and wrong-headed to describe them as Zionists. Hoodlums, for sure. Crooks, no doubt. Thieves, unquestionable. Ruthless, yes. Reckless, yes. Zionists, no. Uh, that's, uh, I, I think that's a, it's a, it's a distinction. And I have to, you know, I don't, like, I don't like what they did to Palestine for sure, but I have to give them credit. You know, it's a kind of credit. I admit it, these are, these are moral gray areas. But I have to give credit to the commitment. You know, someone like Abba Eben, he graduated, I always forget whether it's Oxford or Cambridge. Which is it? Oxford. Oxford. He graduated with uh, triple honors, which is a real feat. You know, he boasts about it in his autobiography, and he has a right to it was a very impressive show. He graduates with triple honors. Uh, he had a beautiful British accent, the elocution, which, you know, could seduce, uh, uh, seduce a hyena. Uh, he was, uh, he was um, impressive. Uh, Aben could have gone anywhere. He could have done anything with his life. Uh, he devoted it to the cause. And don't get the idea because he knew he was going to be important. No. The Zionist movement was... A, a nullity on the political map back then when he joined in. He joined in from conviction, joined in from belief, uh, and to some extent I have to say uh, I respect that. It's a totally different animal than the one we're dealing with now, uh, the, the, the crooks who are uh, uh, claiming to uh, be concerned about the fate of the Jewish people. Uh, that was the Holocaust industry, and the most recent version of the Holocaust industry is what's called the new anti-Semitism. Uh, and the new anti-Semitism is the new card that's being played by the same folks who played the Holocaust industry card. And it's uh, uh, as politically motivated and politically driven as the Holocaust industry card. First of all, the most important point to keep in mind is there's nothing new about the new anti-Semitism. Well, what do I mean by that? If you go back to 1974, 
There's a book that comes out by two guys from the ADL. The ADL is the B'nai B'rith Anti-Defamation League. Uh, they specialize in defamation of character of anyone who disagrees with Israel. <laughs> so the ADL comes out with a book in 1974 by the heads of the ADL, uh, by their heads, namely these two fellows named Arnold Forster and Benjamin Epstein. What's the title of the book? Well, this is a good public library, so I suspect they have it. You can go and check your own, you can check the card catalog or the computer terminal. The title of the book is The New Anti-Semitism. You go to 1982, the head of the ADL at that time is a fellow named uh, Nathan Perlmutter, and together with his wife, Ruth Ann Perlmutter, they put out a book. What's the title of the book? It's called The Real Anti-Semitism. What's it about? Well, look at the first page. It's about the new anti-Semitism. Uh, every 15 or 20 years, they play this new anti-Semitism card. They play it every time Israel is in trouble. So in 1974, it's right after the October 1973 war, and because of, among other things, the Arab use of the oil weapon, uh, new pressures are put on Israel to fully withdraw from the Egyptian Sinai. And as Israel begins to feel the pressure to withdraw from the Sinai, they start playing the new anti-Semitism card. In 1982, Israel is experiencing pressures again, because by this point, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, has joined the international consensus supporting a two-state settlement of the conflict. Well, this is for Israel a catastrophe, because they have been trying to write off the Palestinians as terrorists who want to throw them into the sea, but now the PLO is officially on board supporting the two-state settlement. And there's a nice expression if you look in a, a mainstream Israeli uh, scholarship on the topic, a fellow named uh, Yavner, Avner Yaniv uh, from Tel Aviv University. He wrote a book called Dilemmas of Security, and he says Israel faced a real problem in 1982. The problem was, now I'm quoting him, the PLO's peace offensive. This is a real problem. The... P, the uh, it's amusing that they don't even use these expressions with irony. Uh, the PLO's peace offensive, we have a real problem here. And so along comes the uh, American uh, Jewish elites, and they turn out a book called The, um, the Real Anti-Semitism, saying that all of, these, all of this criticism of Israel is motivated by anti-Semitism. What's really striking when you go through these books, and I have in recent months uh, reread them, What's really striking when you read them is not only at the broad level, but at the level of detail, it's a question of everything old is new again. So let's take this current hysteria. I don't know how it played out in uh, Canada, uh, but in the United States there was this whole hysteria over Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Everybody was up in arms, you know, there's going to be pogroms in the street. Jews, you know, were afraid to pass the Lois Theater because they were going to be attacked. And uh, everybody was joining in this profound debate about the meaning of Mel Gibson's film. You know, I, I thought I was on Mars. Whoever cared about anything Mel Gibson ever said about anything? <laughs> Whoever thought he had a clue of an idea in his head? The only thing I ever remember about Mel Gibson, I'm not a film goer, I admit. I remember there was a graduate student. She was a Lebanese graduate student uh, at Columbia University. She now works for the uh, IMF. Uh, she sold out, uh, and uh, uh, she was on the left back then. She once said she liked Mel Gibson's behind. That's so, the only thing that ever stayed in my mind about him. And then everybody is talking about, you know, analyzing Mel Gibson on the Bible. Who ever thought Mel Gibson was a biblical scholar? You have to be a moron to believe this to begin with. You know, it's like I remember 10 years ago, I was reading these articles about... Uh, the meaning of Michael Jackson's latest lyrics. You know, like we're talking about Yeats or Shakespeare. Whoever cared about Michael Jackson's lyrics, their meaning? And it was this kind of insane hysteria. Who initiated it? It's interesting who initiated it. It was initiated, as some of you may know, by Abraham Foxman. That's an interesting, uh, the head of the ADO. You know, the organization which specializes in defamation of character. Uh, so I was curious. If you go back and look at the new anti-Semitism, it's worth it. It's for fun. You go, uh, I know, you're thinking he must have a very boring life if he thinks that's fun. 
and you're right, he does. Um, you go back to look at the new anti-Semitism, the, uh, the Epstein Forster book, the Forster Epstein book, and the, a centerpiece of their evidence for the new anti-Semitism, a centerpiece is Jesus Christ Superstar, the movie. They say that that's evidence of the new anti-Semitism in 1974. And all the arguments, I mean literally, all the arguments they used to prove that the Jesus Christ superstar was anti-Semitic, they're lifted whole cloth and they reappear during the whole hysteria over passion of the Christ. Um, and it's quite striking if you look at the acknowledgments page of the uh, new anti-Semitism, who's acknowledged? Abraham Foxman. You look at the Nathan Perlmutter, Ruth Ann Perlmutter book, The Real Anti-Semitism, who's on the acknowledgments page? Again, it's uh, Abraham Foxman. It was just stealing a page, literally, from an old book. He knew it worked well back then. He tried it again, and he was quite right. He knew exactly what buttons to press, and the whole hysteria would start again with the new anti-Semitism. It's kind of funny. In the 74 one, I don't know, many of you won't, who would remember, who, who would want to remember, um, the, uh, the music for the Jesus Christ superstar, the big anti-Semite back then, was uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he went on to produce many other big anti-Semitic productions like Cats, you know. <laughs> as somebody said this afternoon, wasn't that K-A-T-Z? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that was the young person, clever. Well, what does the evidence show about this new anti-Semitism? Let's leave aside North America because the heart of the argument, the heart of the problem, the heart of darkness is supposed to be in Europe. That's what they're pointing to. That's the heart of the new anti-Semitism. Do I really? I hear that Canada is getting high up on the list. Uh, well, the most, reputable, uh, the most reputable survey organization, mainstream survey organization, is the Pew Research, P-E-W, and they often produce uh, surveys of public opinion around the world. And right after uh, the year anniversary marking the U.S. attack on Iraq, they published a, a survey of European opinion about the United States a year after Iraq, and they reached a conclusion that exactly uh, stop the press's discovery, most Europeans hate the United States. Well, didn't have to do a big survey to figure that one out, but okay. Uh, but they were curious, so they asked the question about uh, the question of the new anti-Semitism. And, you know, what are the attitudes towards Jews in Europe? And what they found, though it was completely unreported here, what they found was not only was there no evidence of a new anti-Semitism, but comparing their results for three countries with what they found in 1991, namely Great Britain, France, and Germany, they found there's actually been a substantial diminution, a lessening of anti-Semitism in Europe. Jews are more favorably regarded than ever in Europe, which frankly even came as a surprise to myself uh, that there's been a... a uh, 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 diminishing of anti-Semitism uh, in Europe as far as the surveys can tell. Let's take the case of what's supposedly the most notorious instance of anti-Semitism, namely the question of France. Well, let's look at the general picture first. The general picture is there have been several studies that have been produced, major studies, on the European anti-Semitism. Two in particular, they both are called manifestations of anti-Semitism put out by or put out by the European Center, it's called for races, Study of Racism and Xenophobia, the, the acronym they use is RAXIN. Uh, they put out a study a couple of months, around a half year ago, and then another study about a couple of months ago. Big fat studies, one of them was done by uh, a German Jewish uh, center, which is completely loony. I'm gonna leave that aside for a moment and look at the, the, the second one, which is much better, uh, much more authoritative. What did they find? Well, let's look at the general picture. The general picture is in these uh, era of this new anti-Semitism where we're told 
uh, if we, you read Abraham Foxman, you know, much uh, lament, I lament it if you do. Uh, if you read Abraham Foxman, this is the worst outbreak of anti-Semitism since the Nazis came to power. If you read uh, Gabriel Schoenfeld, he put out a book recently called The Return of Anti-Semitism. He's the editor of Commentary magazine. He says, quote, I think it's on page eight, he says, quote, Jews are targeted for murder in the United States. You know, this is the real thing. It's not just Kristallnacht. This is the final solution for Jews in the United States, as you can easily tell from walking down the streets of New York. Uh, uh, it's uh, the final solution. Uh, and, okay, so what is the... Uh, what does the data show? Uh, the data shows for the, the two-year period that they examined, they examined the period uh, roughly from January 2002 to the present uh, until uh, January 2004. For the two-year two period, no Jew has been killed uh, in that period in Europe. There have been five cases of people who suffered injuries serious enough to warrant going to a hospital. A uh, case of someone who needed stitches, someone who needed, who suffered, suffered contusions. Five cases in all of Europe uh, of Jews who needed uh, some sort of uh, medical care. Uh, there have been, uh, let's say, well, let's narrow the focus for a moment and turn to what's supposedly the worst case of the outbreak of anti-Semitism, namely the case of France. In France, you have two cases of the five I mentioned two cases of people who were required hospitalization. Uh, the two cases, there were two cases in France. There were three cases of attacks on Jewish communal property. Uh, a school bus, I think two synagogues, but I'm not, I'm not too sure, but three cases of attacks on Jewish communal property in that two-year period. It should be pointed out that these attacks, all of them I mentioned, they occurred within the same weeks as Operation Defensive Shield and the Siege of Janine. There are no reports of attacks on Jews, Jews or Jewish property in the year 2003, according to reports. Everything happens in April 2002. Okay, those attacks are bad, no question about it, uh, even though they're nothing, they're not the final solution, they're not Kristallnacht, they're not anything, but they're bad. Uh, but what does the public opinion survey show? Well, they've examined France fairly closely. The public opinion survey show that 89% of the French people say they see no difference between a French Jew and a French person in general. Complete absence of anti-Semitism. What's quite striking, incidentally, is, and it will come as a surprise to many of you, as it did to the people who authored the report, that among Muslim French, there is more opposition to anti-Semitism than among French generally. Muslim young people are actually more opposed to anti-Semitism, at least as far as one can judge from the public, relation, public opinion surveys, than uh, Jews, excuse me, than French generally. Uh, the uh, talk about the, the new anti-Semitism is just sheer hysteria. Well, where does it come from? There has to be substance, some substance to the claims. And the substance is, I think it's three parts. Part of it is sheer fraud a lot of the incidents that are claimed are simply made up. Uh, they're fraudulent. They're concocted, literally. I was curious about some of them because for those of you who follow this literature, there's a claim about a massive, rampant, raging anti-Semitism on college campuses across the country. That struck me as very peculiar. I've, I've taught at many universities, not out of choice, but I've, uh, I've been around the block several times in the universities. Uh, so I have a fairly, I have a, a more, a wider experience than I think any other person in professional life teaching. Uh, I've been everywhere. Uh, the one thing you can say about college campuses nowadays, for better or for worse, is it's simply impossible to say anti-Semitic or for that matter anti-black or anti-gay or anti-women things on campus. <coughs> for better or for worse, there's this reign of political correctness and you just can't do it. You know, if, you, if there's any kind of intimation on a college campus nowadays of anti-Semitism or anti-black racism or whatever, you know, they call 20 meetings, they have uh, 50 seances, and, you know, it's, a, it's loony. I, I think it's loony, the kind of political correctness. But the idea, as they, some people say, and if you read these Internet uh, exchanges, that 
One woman wrote, uh, who was the head of the Hillel at San Francisco State University, she says, I walked across college campus and everywhere there was the slogan, Jews equal Nazis. That's just ridiculous. Anyone who's on the college campus knows that's not possible. As I said, for better or for worse, I think part of it is for the better. The climate is more humane. It's more decent. Uh, for worse, because I think it stifled a lot of free ex uh, exchange and discussion, and people no longer say what they feel. They just say what's politically correct to spare themselves the hysteria if they say something wrong, uh, politically incorrect, which I'm not in favor of. I, I, I think it's had a, uh, a very damaging effect, though I have to recognize the positive effect, which is good. Uh, namely, that people feel comfortable about the learning experience and uh, that they're welcome in the classroom. That's good. But the other side is not good, in my opinion. Finding the right balance is not easy, and I don't want to pretend you can. Uh, in any case, uh, so I was curious about these incidents, which uh, uh, I opened up Gabriel Schoenfeld's book. He said, at the University of Chicago, a professor refused to supervise a thesis on Judaism and Zionism. Well, it happens, much to my chagrin, I'm currently in exile in uh, Chicago, my Nakba, I got stuck in Chicago, uh, and I, um, University of Chicago is near, nearby, I, I rang up the Center for Jewish Life, the Hillel, I said, can you tell me about this incident? They said, we never heard of it. Okay, so I called up the Chicago administration, the administrative offices, can you tell me about it? They said, well, the first we ever heard about it is we read about it in the Jerusalem Post. We didn't even know about it. So we checked with the history department. They said what happened was there was a professor asked to supervise a thesis on Judaism and Zionism. Her specialty happened to have been medieval history. She didn't know about the subject. So she told the student to go to another professor. And that became an example of anti-Semitism. Okay. Now, some of you, since I'm told this is an audience that's left of center, it doesn't mean you're going to get arrested on the way out. I was just told that. Um, uh, some of you are readers of Tikkun. Who here reads Tikkun? Raise your hand. Okay, only two, two people have to suffer with that. Okay, so Tikkun is of the left liberal Jewish magazine run by this fellow named Rabbi uh, Lerner. And they had, like everybody else, they had a big story, the new anti-Semitism on their cover, a few months ago. Everybody had to have a story on that. Uh, U.S. News and World Report had a big cover story with letters this size, the new anti-Semitism, New York Magazine, the new anti-Semitism, everywhere, hither and yon, new anti-Semitism. Uh, so the cocoon joins in. They have this woman named Miriam Greenspan write an article on the new anti-Semitism. It's 15 pages, single space. Uh, it's an ordeal. It's an ordeal, for sure, especially since she has no idea what she's talking about, which makes it a bigger ordeal. And she also admits she doesn't know what she's talking about, which is at least honest. Uh, so she has in her first paragraph, she says, Jewish student in Yarmouka assaulted by Arab and Dale and Yale dormitory. Now, that's odd. Yale? Doesn't sound right to me. 40% uh, of the undergraduate body, student body is Jewish. It doesn't seem like the place for pogroms to be happening. So I was curious. I call up the Yale University, the Center for Jewish Life, the Hillel. Can you tell me about the uh, anti-Semitic incident I read about in Tikkun? She said, I've never heard of it. I then called up the Yale administration. Can you tell me about it? Never heard of it. Okay, that's odd. Uh, I then email uh, Miriam Greenspan. Can you tell me about this? Don't get an answer. Email her again. Don't get an answer. So then I email Michael Lerner, the editor of Tikkun. Can you find out about this? He then sends me, CCs me a copy of an email he sent Miriam Greenspan uh, saying, well, Miriam, I think this is a legitimate query. You should answer it. So she answers it. She says, quote, I heard about it on Pat Robertson's 700 Club. <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was her source. That was her source. So then I was curious about this one I mentioned earlier, a woman named Ms. Zoloth, who was the head of the Hillel at San Francisco State University. And she says, you know, walking across campus, all I see is Jews equal Nazis, and we were attacked, and the police just st uh, stood there when the Arabs attacked us, and so on and so forth. Well, I was curious about that. So I talked to people in the Bay Area. Uh, I can't name them because they're, you know, they, they have prominence now and be associated with me, and that's fair enough. Uh, no, it is. Uh, so I asked them about this, and they said, well, you know, uh, she, uh, one of them's, 
I can't even tell you that because it gets too much information. But he said that, well, she used to be a member of a Marxist-Leninist organization called Line of March, and she still has that mental framework uh, from her Marxist-Leninist days. I, called to, I talked to the person who replaced her, and he said the same thing. You know, this is all just fabricated. It's sheer lunacy. Uh, it's just uh, a large part of it is just made up out of thin air. That's one part, the part that's uh, sheer fraud and nonsense. You know, one of the book, main books that came out a few months ago after the ADL started its attack, there's a book that came out by this woman uh, named Phyllis Chesler. It's called Women and Ma uh, It's called A New Antisemitism. And Phyllis Chesler made her reputation by writing this book called Women and Madness. And judging uh, by this current book, you can see she does have expertise in her original <laughs> field. So uh, the book is, you know, it's completely loony. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, nutty. I was telling people a story this afternoon. Uh, I, one of the students is the head of the Hillel at, um, Hillel at DePaul University, a former student of mine, and a decent enough fellow. He dropped my, by my office a few days ago. And he says, we're having a speaker this evening uh, who may interest you to come. I said, well, who are you having? They said, we're having Phil Chesler. I said, look, uh, Phil Chesler, uh, how much are you paying her? 5000 because that's the numbers they charge nowadays, and they, or 10 they, they get big money. I said, uh, how much are you? He says, well, I said, 5000 He says, thereabouts, which means 10 I know, and he doesn't want to tell me. <laughs> so I said to him, come on, Steve. If I were you, use the $10,000 to give out free latkes at the ball, and you'll get more friends than if you have Phyllis Chesler, because she's a complete embarrassment. She's an idiot. She's an imbecile. He so his face drops, and he says to me, well, what do you mean she's an imbecile? I said, look, I have the book on her shelf. I read it a couple of times because I'm using it for something I'm writing. I get the book. I said, look, turn to page 116. He turns to page 116. I said, look what she says. She says in the top of page 116, she says, hundreds of thousands of Jews after 1948 fled from Arab countries like India. I said, <laughs> I, I said, Steve, I'm serious. And she says it twice. It's not, it's not a typo. It's there twice. I say, Steve, and he's a bright guy. Bright fellow, no question about it. Wrote the best quality papers in my class when I had them. I said, Steve, now India is not an Arab country. He says to me, well, maybe she meant geo. I said, Steve, stop. <laughs> We're not playing this game. India is not an Arab country. Language, Indian, religion, Hindu, it's not an Arab country. Let's stop. Okay. He said, all right, I'll agree. It's not an Arab country. But then I said... She has a long praise for Arab dissidents who are willing to take on, you know, the Arab uh, monsters. And one of the persons she praises is Aung Lee, the, uh, the Arab Muslim woman from Arab Burma. <laughs> I said, Steve, she's not Arab. She's not Muslim. She's Buddhist. Burma is Buddhist. This woman is an imbecile, you know. And they're cited as the authorities. They are the authorities in the topic. Her book is the main, uh, her book and Schoenfeld's book are now the two main books on the new anti-Semitism. So a lot of it, you know, is a mixture of sheer fabrication and sheer lunacy. Uh, and then you have another, another category. So that's one aspect of the new anti-Semitism. A second aspect is uh, simply conflating, confusing any criticism of Israel with criticism of, uh, with anti-Semitism. Literally, not, I'm not saying it's done subtly, it's literally done that way. I mentioned that earlier there are two European reports uh, done on the anti-Semitism, and you can always rely on the Germans to come up with the, the looniest ones because they're the most politically correct on this particular issue. And they produced a report, I forgot, from one of the centers in Germany on the topic, and they give all their examples of anti-Semitism. So what are their examples? They say in Italy, at a meeting of the newly constituted Communist Party, people were seen wearing kafiyas, you know, the Arab headscarf. That's proof of anti-Semitism. And there were books on display 
by Palestinian authors. I'm not saying they didn't say Protocols of Elders of Zion, but she said Palestinian authors, that's proof of anti-Semitism. Or they say in the case of Amsterdam, some of you may recall the episode during the siege of Janine when the wife of the head of the European bank, Greta Duisenberg, she hoisted the Palestinian flag on her balcony. That's pointed to as evidence of anti-Semitism. Well, if you use that standard, any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, well, then you're going to have a large chunk of anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, the ADL puts out its surveys. Just a few months, a few weeks ago, there was that meeting in Berlin to discuss the new anti-Semitism where Powell went and all of that, you know, the whole show uh, went uh, to Berlin. And uh, my, my, my uh, oh, and the ADL put out its latest survey. And the survey showed that one-third of Europeans are anti-Semitic. Oh, yeah, it's true if you go by their survey. But you have to look at the questions they ask. They ask questions like, do you think Jews talk too much about the Holocaust? If you answered yes, you're anti-Semitic. Well, I'm sorry. I do think they talk too much about the Holocaust, if you ask my opinion. And then there's a question, do you think Jews are more loyal to their country or to Israel? Well, if you're a Zionist, you're supposed to believe they're more loyal to Israel. So that would make most Zionists anti-Semitic. That's the whole point. Your first loyalty is supposed to be to the Jewish state. So if you go by the ADL surveys, yeah, I think one-third is a conservative estimate. I would think it's probably closer to nine-tenths are anti-Semitic by their standard. And then there's the third category. There's the sheer fraud. There's the conflating of anti-Semitism with uh, criticism of Israel. And then the third category, for lack of a better term, it's the category of the spillover. Namely, a large, because Israel calls itself a Jewish state, because it legally defines itself as the sovereign state of the Jewish people, because world mainstream Jewish organizations overwhelmingly and uncritically support everything Israel says and does, it's unsurprising that people critical of Israel will then become critical of Jews, generally. Is it right? No. Is it source for shock? Well, hardly. I mean, I'm old enough to remember during the war in Vietnam where criticism of, of American policy spilled over into anti-Americanism. Uh, there was a famous book that came out in the 50s called The Ugly American where uh, this, uh, uh, dislike of American policy was conflated with disliking all Americans. It's not right, but it's certainly not source of a shock. Uh, somebody from Germany certainly knows the spillover effect, namely criticism of Nazi policy, then became a criticism of all Germans and this anti-Teutonic uh, hysteria, which endures to this day. It's not easy for a German outside Germany to say, I'm German. Uh, is that right? No. Is it surprising? Not really, given the atrocities committed by the Nazis. It's wrong, but the spillover effect is not altogether surprising. And the same thing happened in the case of uh, Israeli policy in particular because it's a self-identified Jewish state and uh, it has the overwhelming support, public support, of uh, Jewish organizations around the world. That, to me, uh, sort of exhausts the question of the new anti-Semitism. And that brings me to the last fabricated source of a disagreement on the Israel or fabricated source of disagreement on the Israel-Palestine conflict. The first one was the effort to mystify it. The second one was the playing of the Holocaust and now the new anti-Semitism card. And the third source of disagreement is in many ways, it's a subject of a lot of amusement, I think. It's funny. But it's also in many ways the most depressing The, the depressing aspect of the whole conflict. And that is, on the Israel-Palestine conflict, there is such a, I, when I say depressing, I don't mean the actual human tragedy there. I mean how it's played out here. Uh, in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict, there's this vast proliferation on the subject of sheer, pristine fraud. 
And that's a real problem. Now, it's true that lots of things are published each day, each week, which are fraudulent uh, and nonsense on any number of topics, probably on all topics, you know, even on the whether the earth is flat or not. Uh, you know, people are still committed to the idea that it is. So uh, a lot of fraud is produced on all subjects, no doubt about it. But the Israel-Palestine conflict does have a peculiar quality. And the peculiar quality is, if you're in academic life, uh, and I, I know you have my condolences if you are, if you're in academic life, there are certain mechanisms which sort of act as a preliminary filter sorting out the nonsense from what has some virtue. You know, it's just a, a form of what you would call quality control. And they have mechanisms in the natural sciences, and I suspect there are people here who are in the natural sciences, the mechanisms of quality control are quite formidable. And the main mechanism is you simply reproduce an experiment. If somebody claims to have found breath, you know, uh, uh, substantial new make substantial new claims about a particular field of uh, uh, his, his or her field of uh, inquiry. The challenge always is laboratories around the country, around the world now, they reproduce the experiment and see if they get the same results. And that's a form of quality control. We can separate out the quacks from the authentic uh, uh, practitioners of science. And generally speaking, it seems to work. I don't know anything about the field, and I'm fully, you know, I want to be honest about those things, but I remember there was a famous scandal of a professor from uh, MIT who then became the president of um, uh, the, the top research university in the United States, Rockefeller University, named Baltimore. How many people remember the Baltimore story? Anyone? Okay. Uh, and Baltimore was accused of fraud, and it became a big story. Uh, and I... and. The hero was this Irish woman, a low-level employee who blew the whistle. Uh, and uh, it was a great story, you know, the stuff like Aaron Brockovich. How do you pronounce that? Brockovich? Brockovich. It was that kind of story. I loved it. You know, the little person bringing down the big person. It was terrific. And I remember I asked Professor Chomsky about it. Uh, so I said, well, what do you think? Isn't that a great story? He says, and he was very, you know, he didn't want to be aggressive about it. He says, I don't think that happened with the fraud. He said, I know Baltimore quite well, because he was at MIT. And he said, that just doesn't happen in science. I said, why, why not? He said, well, because uh, whenever somebody makes a claim, within 24 hours, there are people all around the world trying to reproduce the results to see whether it's true or not. So it's very, very difficult to have fraud in science. I don't know if it's true, but I respect you know, Professor Chomsky's uh, opinion on the topic, and those of you who are natural scientists in the audience, you know, you can judge for yourself whether that's accurate. When you come to the areas in which I, you know, my professional life is devoted, uh, they sometimes call them the social sciences, which is stupid because, you know, they're not science. It's social studies. When, in, in those fields, we don't have those impressive mechanisms uh, or those exacting mecha mechanisms of quality control, but we have some things. If you're an academic, and somebody comes to you and says and, and puts forth an aberrant argument, an unusual thesis or argument, you always give that skeptical look. First of all, it's partially jealousy. You know, he or she found something that's, you know, you don't. You know, it's the, it's the eureka thing. And you look and you give that skeptical look. And the first question you ask, or one of the first questions you ask is, you know, who published that book? You know, but that's a form of quality control. If you know it's a... University press, it's peer-reviewed. That's the fancy word for other professors have to read a manuscript before it gets published. If it's a mainstream, reputable publisher like Random House or something like that, you assume that um, a, a good editor has gone through it. And then if it's a little press or a vanity press, you figure, uh, yeah, maybe it's breathtaking because the author is a crackpot. And that's a form of quality control. So, you know, my experience was I walked in and I saw Harper and Rowe publish this book. That was the first signal uh, there's something serious here. And I told you the beginning of my remarks. I said the next thing I did, you may recall, I said is I flipped to the back to see who blurbed the book. Because in the academic life, the next question you typically ask is who blurbed the book? And you turn to the back and you check, you know, whether these are reputable authorities 
who have given lent their name and their position uh, to a book. That's a second kind of quality control. And then the third typically is, um, uh, you know, people can disagree with me because I'm sure there are academics in the audience. The third is you ask, who reviewed the book? You're curious about the reviews uh, and what quality, you know, review uh, they got. And those are all kinds of quality control. I'm not saying they work perfectly. I'm not saying they're excellent. Uh, you know, Professor Chomsky, he... Uh, published with small publishing houses out of choice. In uh, Canada, it was mostly, what was the anarchist press he published with? Black Rose. Black Rose in the United States South End. As a matter of commitment and choice, he, he went with a small publishing house. And uh, nonetheless, the work is, I think, uh, most people, or normal people will agree, is a quality work. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, uh, there, uh, somebody who I'll get to in a moment, Alan Dershowitz, uh, he's been on the offensive against me, and he says that, you know, Finkelstein has never gotten an article published by a peer-reviewed journal, uh, and it's not far off the mark. I mean, I can make uh, count the claims, but it's not far off the mark. That's true, uh, and I, I never even bother submitting because uh, I know if my peers ever reviewed what I had to say, uh, you know, it would come back probably covered in blood. Uh, so I don't even bother. Um, so I'm not saying the mechanism works perfectly, but it's an imperfect mechanism but nonetheless, uh, imperfect but nonetheless works to some extent. But there's a very unusual thing that happens, and I, I think it is unusual, when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict. That is, you can have a book published by an excellent publisher. It can receive excellent blurbs when you turn to the back. It can receive excellent reviews. And all that being said, it can yet still be sheer fraud. And that's unusual. I started my talk with the Joan Peters from Time Immemorial. And it's appropriate that I end it with the Alan Dershowitz, The Case for Israel. Now, Dershowitz has a serious name. He's the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, chair, Felix Frankfurter chair. He's the highest ranking uh, professor at Harvard Law School, a very distinguished position. He published the book, The Case for Israel, with John Wiley, a reputable press. The book received excellent reviews. And the book is, from start to finish, beginning, in my opinion, with the author's name, and all the way to the last full stop, the book is a sheer fraud. I don't, even, I don't believe he wrote the book, and as I've told him to his face, I don't even think before you debated me, you read the book. You have, you have, no, you have no idea. He had no idea what was in the book. I mean, I knew what was in the book. He did not. Later, after I debated him on a program called Democracy Now!, he went around telling all the newspapers that he was ambushed. And you know what? He had an argument there. There, there was an argument because it was unfair. Because when he debated me, I had read the book and he hadn't. <laughs> that, that was an ambush. It was really unfair. The whole book is sheer nonsense. It's an interesting kind of nonsense. The first two chapters, they're plagiarized whole cloth. Now, some of you are thinking, ah, oh, plagiarism, who cares? When I was in college, I plagiarized too. Thank God I wasn't caught. Yeah, okay. Uh, and there's an argument to be said. You know, uh, I was a young person. I still you know, deeply respect and admire uh, the folk singer uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, some of you may know him. And Pete Seeger's father was a famous musicologist, Charles Seeger, and Pete Seeger used to like to quote his father, Charles Seeger, to the fact that, quote, plagiarism is basic to all culture. Uh, <laughs> which is to say, if you know folk music, how you could see how everybody's copying everybody's tunes and so on and so forth. Uh, and so you may not get so exercised about the issue of plagiarism. But there are two peculiarities with Dershowitz. First of all, even if you don't get yourself exercised about plagiarism, it happens as everybody who's gone to college, and I think probably most of this audience has, in, in university life, plagiarism is a big deal. 
it's about the only thing where you suffer a significant penalty, you know, to the point of being expelled. So, for example, with the university where I currently teach, the syllabus, apart from what books you're going to read, what weeks, grade computation, the one thing every syllabus has to include is a large section on penalties for plagiarism. They take plagiarism very seriously in a university. For better or for worse, that's a separate issue. And Dershowitz plagiarized, no question about it, large chunks of those first two chapters. But that's the beginning of the story. The end is, or I should say the middle is, he plagiarized from Joan Peters from Time Immemorial. <laughs> the guy plagiarized a hoax. Now, that's pretty shameful. <laughs> you really, in academic life, you can't get much worse. It's like you're submitting a book in the Nazi Holocaust, and you're plagi excuse me, submitting a paper in the Nazi Holocaust, and you plagiarize the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's pretty shoddy. He plagiarizes a hoax. There's no question about it. I mean, I have, as it happens, to use that expression, the smoking gun. By accident, I stumbled on the smoking gun. Um, large parts of the book, if you compare the first two chapters of his book with the Joan Peters, it's all the same quotes, and he, he doesn't say from Joan Peters, he cites her source, these 19th century, uh, 19th century travel logs from the Middle East. So he cites, you know, from Burkhardt, from him, from her, and she cites from Burkhardt, from him, from her, and you align them, it's exactly the same. So he says, well, not true, Finkelstein's making it up, because yes, I saw it in Peters' book, but I checked it on my own. So he claims that because he saw it, he checked what he saw in Peters' book, it's not plagiarism, which is already absurd. Anyone who knows anything about academic life, let's say somebody writes a book which has 10,000 footnotes, and then you reproduce exactly the same book with the 10,000 footnotes using the original sources, not saying as cited in, not as cited in. And you claim that's your original research. You know, you'd laugh. What do you mean your original research? Even if you went back and checked the sources, you're pretending you did research when you didn't. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. It happened by coincidence that... Um, in publishing life, there's this thing called advanced proofs. And advanced proofs is basically this. Authors like, and publishing houses, like to have reviews timed to come out the day of what's called the publication date of the book, the pub date. It helps promote the book. And often the book is not yet ready several months in advance. Authors are still working on the book. So they send out what's called advanced proofs, which is an incomplete version of the book, that you give to a reviewer, he or she will now have several months to look at the incomplete version and then write a review to be timed when the complete version comes out on the pub date. I hope that's clear, okay? So by coincidence, somebody sends me an email and says, you know, I have a copy of the, um, the advanced proofs for Dershowitz's book. You want to look at it? And I said, well, what the hell not? You know, send it. Maybe something interesting there. I open it up. And it happens in this advanced version, uh, they hadn't yet filled in all the footnotes, but they had filled in some. And it says he has his research assistant's names. One is a woman, a woman named Beth. He says, Beth, you know, footnote seven, cite from page so-and-so or from time immemorial. <laughs> well, there's not much ambiguity left now. He didn't go back to the original. It's right there. He's copying right up her book. What's interesting is it all came out, because the Internet has democratized life a little bit, it all came out. Uh, some people wrote about it. And the reviews, I had already gone through the book before the reviews came out. They came out mostly belatedly in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Post. They all knew about the fraud. It was known if you put it on the web, on the Google, Finkelstein Dershowitz, you'll get like 3,000 hits, which is something. It's not a lot, but it's something. Uh, uh, it was widely publicized. It didn't affect the reviews at all. Nothing. It was a non-event. Uh, nobody mentioned it. 
book is excellent, maybe a little partisan, but still an excellent book. Didn't touch it all. That's the plagiarism. Large parts of the book are just sheer fraud. I'll tell you, I was kind of surprised at that. I really was. In the case of Joan Peters, okay, she took real documents and she doctored them. So when there was a knot somewhere in the middle of a sentence, she put the ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Okay, not very good. No. <laughs> but at least, at least, <laughs> okay, but to her credit, we may say, at least she's citing real documents. With Dershowitz, it's just out of thin air. He takes a case, one, I'll just cite, give you an example. Uh, there was the, on the issue of torture and Israel's use of torture. There was a famous case in 1995 of a fellow named Harazad, a Palestinian who was shaken to death. And it became a national issue in Israel because the shaking was one of their torture techniques, fairly widely practiced. Rabin at that time estimated, Rabin estimated that 8,000 Palestinians had been uh, subject to this form of torture called shaking. And uh, Harazat died from it. Uh, and it became a national issue in Israel after his death. And multiple pathologists examined the body. There were two uh, pathologists who first examined the body from Israel itself. A third from Dundee University in Scotland, uh, Derek Pounder. He examined the body. Then they all concurred, died from shaking. Then the Justice Ministry of Israel came out with a statement and said, died from shaking. They disputed whether or not the interrogators could have known in advance that the shaking would have proven ultimately lethal, but they don't deny it was from shaking. Then it went to another Tel Aviv pathologist, yet another person named Liss. He said, died from shaking. Then there was a famous Supreme Court case on the issue of torture, and the High Court of Justice, it says in its decision, all agree died from shaking, meaning all parties, the state and the petitioners, all agree died from shaking. You go to Dershowitz's book, he says he didn't die from shaking. He died from a pre-existing medical condition as confirmed by an independent investigation. And what does he cite? He cites the High Court of Justice decision. But the decision said, all agreed, died from shaking. And you go through the book. I've been going through it because I'm writing now a book on him. Uh, uh, I am. He's putting up a stiff fight. I only have a couple of seconds' time. He's putting up a stiff fight. He's, you know, a great civil libertarian, uh, Mr. Dershowitz. Uh, he uh, sent a, first a five-page single-space letter to my publisher telling them not, uh, why they should not publish the book, although he says, I'm all for free speech. But he says, if there is, you know, he implies, if there is publication of the book, there is massive libel in the book, you know. Just wants you to know. He keeps saying, I'm putting you on notice. I'm putting you on notice. You're on notice. But of course, he says, I'm for free speech. And then he sent another letter, uh, five pages, single space, a separate one. I mean, the man's gone berserk. He's ballistic now. Uh, to all the members of the editorial board, again. And he asked, the, uh, I won't go through the details, but, you know, he's a slightly desperate man, I, I, I think, at this point. But what's really astonishing is it's the level of fraud which simply passes as scholarship in our society on this subject. And what's also, that's astonishing, but it's also for those of us who want to find a silver lining in the cloud, a uh, light at the end of the tunnel. There is something there which should give us lots of hope. And that's how I'll conclude my remarks. What should give us hope is the following. People used to ask me when I, when I uh, discussed the Dershowitz case, they said, why did he do something like that? There he is at Harvard. He has all these research assistants. 
he has so much money, so much access to resources, why didn't he just hire fact checkers to uh, clear out all the debris, all the nonsense from the book? I thought that was an interesting question because it tells us a whole lot. What's the most striking thing about Dershowitz's book, he devotes about one-third of it to human rights issues, torture, house demolitions, political liquidations, what's called uh, targeted assassinations, all that sort of stuff, the human rights issues. And it's very striking that even though he devotes a third of the book to that, he never once, literally never once, on any of these factual, moral, or legal questions bearing on human rights, never once can he cite a single mainstream human rights organization to support his claim. He can never cite Amnesty International in support of his argument. He can never cite Human Rights Watch in support of his argument. He can never cite the, multiple, the multiplicity of Israeli human rights organizations, why can't he? Why didn't he? Not because he doesn't want to. He's smart enough to know if you can get amnesty on board on your side, that's a big plus. It's not that he doesn't want to. It's that he can't. And that's the most devastating insight, but the one that should give us hope. If he actually cited what the documentary record shows, if he actually cited what the human rights record showed, he couldn't have called his book The Case for Israel. It would have to have been called The Case for Palestine. Thank you.